Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk. My name is Julia Simon. This is a story about my experience with depression and burnout. So welcome, and thank you so much for um, having me here. I'm really honored and happy to be presenting this, um, what was a challenging story, um, in a really positive light. So thank you so much, CD Con, and to the wonderful folks at the Continuous Delivery Foundation for um, accepting this talk and acknowledging that this is a point um, that we need to be t discussing more in, in our world of, of work and uh, technology. So a little bit about me before we get going. Um, I live in Montreal, Canada. I've lived abroad as well, and I speak a variety of different languages. I am also a very proud mother to a fun and fiery 10-year-old boy. And I work at a company called CloudOps. We are a cloud computing solutions company based here in Montreal. Um, and I do learning and development and community work for that organization. So I'm very proud to be part of the DevOps and the CNCF communities um, in our area and now online. Uh, I'm also an animal lover. I have a cat named Flash um, and I'm an avid cyclist. It's really my happy place to be um, getting some alone time on my bike, rain, or shine. I do want to add a quick caveat that I am not a mental health professional. This story is really about my personal journey um, and what happened to me and how I was able to recover. It is by no means meant to be medical advice. Um, there is, however, a lot of information about burnout on research and science and um, the facts about what happens to us physiologically when we burn out. So um, there are lots of resources for that available, um, but this is really my kind of user story as to what happened to me. So again, we are here to um, chat about what my experience was with mental health. Um, it's something that I never thought would happen to me or affect me, um, and it did. And so I wanted to share that story and I wanted to start and create more dialogue around the topic. It's still quite stigmatized in general in the world. And I wanted to share my experience because for me, it was one of personal growth. It was not one of um, shame or there are many other negative feelings that can be associated to, to the stigma of mental health. And so I wanted to share my experience and um, try to speak more openly about these topics that affect all of us or many of us. So if we start at the beginning, what is burnout? Uh, so burnout is um, a professional phenomenon as recognized by the World Health Organization. It uh, is basically chronic fatigue or exhaustion. So we all have different stress levels or stressors in our life. Um, when we feel burnt out, it is something that has been sustained for a very long period of time. Um, that can range from work, home, family, a variety of stressors that, that exist. Um, for me, it also came in the form of a bit of an existential crisis. I really um, wasn't sure what I was doing with my life, uh, both uh, just as a person and also professionally. So that created a lot of apathy for me, frustration, cynicism. I really wanted to disconnect from where what I was doing. Um, that for me was a pretty significant sign because I'm a pretty <laughs> collaborative and friendly person. So when I started to get frustrated or annoyed with um, simple requests or people asking things of me, that was definitely a sign for me. Um, I also felt quite incompetent at work. So I had been doing my job for about five years before this happened to me. So this happened in um, 2019. Um, I've been at the company now for over six years. But at the time, um, I, I started to feel like I wasn't able to do my job properly. I felt like I wasn't effective and I wasn't adding value anymore. Uh, I also went, I now know, was in um, a, a mild depression. And so that led to me not sleeping well. Um, and it led to me just having generally unhealthy relationships with responsibilities and obligations in my life, work being one of them, but not exclusively. So I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but again, because it is my personal journey, um, this is something that that played a role in my in my burnout. So the context around women and how we are brought into um, the workplace and the 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 load that 
um, women carry or many women carry. Again, it's not the case uh, across the board, but in my personal situation, it was. So we typically, women are typically um, doing more parental and household chores than um, our counterparts. And so for me, that, that was a pretty significant weight. Um, and then also it was the expectation that, well, when you're in the workplace, well, you know, you you compete in the workplace as you would, regardless of all the other things or all the, the other domestic um, responsibilities that you have. So you're meant to um, perform, excel, advance, compete, and do all these things in a way as if as if it was a level playing field. And in my particular case, that, that wasn't necessarily the case because um, because of the, the situation of me being a single parent, we're going to get into that into in a minute. So the other thing, of course, those are the kind of the external factors, but the internal factors were also my personal programming and the person that I am and how my relationship with a variety of, of, of obligations and responsibility. So I, I do have a healthy sense of responsibility. Um, I do want to make sure that things are done, that they're done well, that we're checking things off a list, that I'm productive and useful. And that is really where my value lay, was in the number of things I got done and in the number of things I got done well. So this element of perfectionism has been there since the beginning. Um, also an element of sort of being quite hard on myself and and criticizing myself or, or maybe judging myself when things didn't go to, as, as I had planned or didn't end up as great as I thought they would be. So that element of my, my personal programming and, and the person that I am really um, played a role in this as well. So the triggers for me were really layers of an onion that um, took several years actually to develop. So it was a bit of a slow a slow burn, a slow decline into not feeling good. Um, so it started several years ago with a difficult se separation from my son's father. So that was element number one that was difficult. That led me then um, to being a single parent and also going back into the workplace formally. And so I started this new great job at CloudOps, but I didn't know anything about technology. And I needed to learn and I needed to really get involved and I cared a lot and I really enjoyed what I was doing. Um, and it also meant that I could, you know, invest myself as, as much as would allow, uh, of course, with my, my other home responsibilities. So that took, that, that took quite a bit out of me as well, and I was happy to give it. Um, and because I was the sole marketer at the time, I was, I was um, in running the marketing department there, um, I was the, the, there, was, there were infinite possibilities as to what we could do as an organization. So it started to kind of overwhelm me because it was, there were so many things that needed to get done. Eventually the team did grow, which alleviated things a little bit. Um, and then I had my first uh, experience with grief. Um, my beloved dog of 13 years passed away. And it was the first time that I had lost a being that was so, so close and so important to me. And so while I was ready for her to pass, I had no clue how grief would affect me. And so because I was already feeling quite low, um, although I didn't realize it at the time, this event kind of just came in and sent me down, further down the rabbit hole that I was already going down. So that was a really difficult experience and one that I think also really marked um, how I was feeling. So those, again, external factors in conjunction with the desire to please, um, this sense of obligation to make sure that, oh, if somebody asked me to do something, well, I have to do it because they're asking me as if I didn't have a choice in the matter, um, as well as wanting to prove myself, especially in this new role um, and, and this new industry and, and caring about what how I was perceived in that. Um, I do also want to um, just quickly call out that these are, again, my personal triggers and um, what was going on for me. And it's not to minimize the fact that even if you don't have all of these things going on in your life or you're not a parent or you don't have stressors at home, doesn't mean that you can't feel all of these things. So um, in my case, there were many, many, many different elements, and that's just how it manifested. Um, but it's not to diminish anyone who might be feeling um, fatigued or stressed or burnt out, especially in this wild pandemic year that we've had. 
So I kept going um, and I continued because I didn't realize any of this was an issue. Um, and I just thought this was normal life and this is how it is. And you've, you work and you have home and, and you suffer through it basically. Um, and in 2018, so a year before this, this breakdown happened for me, I had been to see my doctor um, and she suggested antidepressants and she suggested getting a new puppy. Um, both these ideas for me were seemed ridiculous at the time. Um, I was absolutely not ready to get a new pet and the idea of antidepressants really seemed taboo and I wasn't ready to do that. So I kept doing some talk therapy, which helped, but eventually then a year later in 2019, I, I could no longer um, carry the weight of, of, all the, of all the burden and obligation I had put on myself. And so it really felt like I was starting to drown from that weight. And I was watching other people in an ocean swimming along as if they were doing the Iron Man. And for me, I was just, I couldn't, I was having trouble just treading water and, and, and struggling to breathe. And I felt very alone. So one of the main reasons why I was prompted to also give this talk is because I want other people to understand that you're not alone. And it might feel that way. And for me, that was one of the, the biggest issues was that I, I, I felt like I should be able to do this. And what's wrong with me that I'm not able to do it? Um, and so that was not a fun feeling, of course, that contributed then again on, on top of all the other things that I was experiencing. Eventually, I then decided I have to take a step back and I have to stop working. Um, this was a massive blow for me because it felt like a failure. In hindsight, um, I think it was a very courageous act and one that I'm extremely proud of and um, one that I'm happy that I took to be able to take care of myself. But at the time, it felt like I was just juggling and walking away and letting everything fall. And it really felt like failure. And so on the Friday, I announced to my boss and my colleagues that on the Monday, I wasn't going to be coming in, um, which was very emotional and very difficult for me to do. Um, but I did it because the idea of feeling into that and realizing, oh my God, I just like, oh, I can, you know, walk weightless or not, not have all that pressure. Um, it felt like I was being released from prison, really. Um, and not to say that that's how I felt my work was, but that's how I felt my, my, um, the pressure that I was putting on myself. That's really what it felt like. Um, and I knew that there was also something in the career and the job that I was doing that wasn't sitting um, exactly right, but we'll get into that um, a little bit later. So for me, it was really this coming to terms with the, the emotions that I was feeling. Um, what am I going to do with my professional life? What is the meaning of life? Um, why does anything matter? I really got existential like that. So I continued um, my therapy. I did ask for additional help. I met with different um, therapists and coaches who were, were able to help me. Um, one of the main things that I um, learned that is, for example, an exercise where I was able to visualize little Julia right here sitting on my hand. Um, and how would I nurture her? And how, how would I treat her if she was just this little being who needed me to help her? Uh, and I realized what a stark difference that was from the way I was uh, you know, treating myself or trying to take care of myself. So that was really helpful. I also then did take antidepressants. Um, and so we'll get into that in a minute. So I had to rebuild the foundation. <clears throat> I started to um, take this all on as my full-time job uh, to the point where my doctor said, Julia, you need to relax and chill out because I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm off work. Well, let's go. And I'm going to do this and this and this and this. And it really doesn't work that way. I really had to give myself permission to do nothing. Very difficult. I had to give myself permission to uh, rest. I um, wanted to connect, reconnect with myself. And one of the exercises, as I mentioned, was having little Julia sitting on my hand, but also just feeling into my body and my intuition. I realized I was so much in my head and looking at things rationally as opposed to feeling, well, do I want to do this? Is this going to bring me benefit? Is this going to bring me value and joy? Um, and that really helped me set boundaries and the ability to say no. I had to learn how to say no. Very difficult, uh, very challenging, it still is. Um, but when it comes from a place of honoring myself, it's much easier. 
Um, I also have a solid meditation practice that I was able to, um, you know, rely on. I learned how to journal and write things down. I spent time in nature. I went to visit horses. Um, I live in a city where there's a mountain and on the mountain, there is a stable for the police horses. I would bike up there usually in tears and go just hang out with the horses. I would try to ride any animals that I could be around um, or dirt that I could get my hands in by doing gardening um, really helped me. As I mentioned, I did take antidepressants. I ended up taking them at a fairly low dose for about six weeks. Um, and at the end of that, rather than, I was having some side effects. Um, so my legs were feeling quite heavy. Uh, I was having trouble breathing when biking. And it, it created a bit of a flat line. So I, I no longer felt the sadness and I was able to really get perspective on things that were happening and, and the deep hole that I felt myself being in. So now I wasn't in the hole, I was kind of standing beside the hole looking down. So I had that perspective, but I wasn't feeling joyful. And I really wanted to do activities and be excited to do those things with my son. So after that, um, I after those six weeks of the medication, I then did a few other things and, and rested and, and took care of myself. So I was off work for about three and a half months and I did eventually go back to work. Um, and then I realized, oh, right, this professional journey is not clear for me. What am I gonna do? What do I love to do? Do I wanna be here? Um, and I was in a, you know, I'm in a technical company and I'm one of the only non-technical people or I was at the time. So there, there, my options felt limited in that sense. Um, and I realized, well, what do I do? I asked for help again. So I did some professional coaching. I realized um, what my strengths were, what my talents were. And one of the exercises that I did in that, um, in that session or in that process was having asking other people, um, what talents or strengths do they see in me? And this was really powerful because for me, again, th these things come naturally. So I can identify them, but I don't have to think about doing them. And many things that other people identified, I never really saw in myself because it was so innate. So it was a really great and helpful exercise to be able to get a little perspective and to understand what do I like doing and what would I like and where would I like to take this and how can I work with those natural strengths. So I proposed um, a new role at CloudOps and I'm eternally grateful for their openness and open-mindedness around giving me the, um, the space to be able to propose something. And I, luckily the company was at a place where we were growing and there was a, there was a space in the people and culture team um, for me to kind of create this world around learning, development and community, which is, has been a really fun and exciting um, learning experience for me. And I'm kind of starting fresh again in, in, an industry, or in an industry that I know, but in a domain that is new to me. I did go back to work progressively um, after my time off. And once I hit four days, I realized, Ooh, yeah, OK, this is my max and this is what feels good to me right now. So I did ask for a special accommodation to work four days a week. Um, it was granted to me, and that is something that is absolutely invaluable. Um, it allows me to have a day to do something else. Sometimes those days are really busy. Sometimes they're not, and I take long walks, um, and I really try to recharge. It also gives me a lot more patience and room and space for my parenting. Um, so it's something that I, I, I really value and has really significantly helped me. In addition to that, here are a few other things that have made a pretty significant impact on me. So um, at the time when I stopped working, I removed all my social media apps. I turned off all my notifications. This is actually still a practice that I do now. It's something that I, um, I, I want to be able to choose when I go and see the noise. I don't want it to be pushed at me. And I found that to be very overwhelming. So that was a tip that I, that I um, would like to share that was very useful. I also put um, a budget aside to buy pre-made meals and to once in a while have somebody come and help me with the cleaning of my home. It reduced my anxiety significantly, um, but I judged myself very harshly for that and I thought it should be something that I should be able to do. Um, and once I kind of let go of that and, and really saw it as a, as a helpful um, tool and a way for me to feel better, uh, it really made a huge difference. Um, I also started asking myself, well, what's the worst that can happen? Um, and once I was able to kind of get into that and keep asking, oh, this happens? Okay, and then what? What's the worst that can happen? It, the, it really started to diffuse the situation. So that really helped me a lot. 
Um, again, some of the other things that I mentioned in terms of uh, healthy lifestyle, meditation, spent, spending time with my, my friends and family um, and people that really um, brought joy. So not doing things out of obligation because somebody asked me to go to some party, but really kind of pruning um, the, the tree of what was valuable and what was really close and very important to me. So it gave me a, a bit of permission to kind of clean house a little bit and really prioritize and understand my my limits and my boundaries as to how I how I wanted to do that. And then, of course, um, doing things that make me happy. Um, and I would reward myself with those things for having small accomplishments. So if I was cleaning the bathroom or vacuuming, um, I would do something nice that that made me feel really happy after that, um, even if it was as simple as having a cup of tea. So all that to say that if you are feeling in some way down or sad or burnt out or exhausted, please talk to somebody about it. It makes a huge difference to not be carrying the burden alone. Um, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to a friend or colleague or even your manager. It really does make a difference to talk about it. Um, and think about what makes you happy, especially in the year that we've had. There's you know, a, lot, a lot that's been challenging, but also a lot that we can be thankful for and grateful for. So trying to look at those things. Um, and if you do work on a team or if you're in a leadership role, um, ask people how they're doing. Genuinely ask with curiosity and, and listen to their answers. Don't just do it out of courtesy. Really do it because you want to hear what they have to say. And it's not up to you to solve their issues or their problems. But if you can be supportive and lend an ear, um, it's really a wonderful feeling to have. And in that vein, if you are able to accommodate somebody, um, with a schedule or a certain request that they might have, and there is a flexibility to do that in, in, in the role, um, I strongly encourage it because it really does make a difference. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your time and attention, and I wish you all a very happy and healthy rest of the, the conference, and I look forward to hearing your um, questions and remarks in the chat. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you all for attending and listening. And I'd uh, love to hear if anyone has any questions or comments. I think we had one um, question a little earlier up, which um, was, I am wondering if burnout only happens during bad times. So thanks for that question. Um, I think the idea of bad time is really subjective. It really depends on what is going on for you um, and what constitutes a bad time. Um, as I mentioned in the talk, for me, it, it was like the compounded. So it's not like there was just one bad thing that happened to me. It was like the compounding of difficult situations. And we often don't take time to kind of integrate those things and um, accept them or adapt to them. So um, I guess my answer to that would be it's not just during bad times. Um, I think when I look back at my life, I can't say, oh, my gosh, like I, I've had a bad life or a, a particularly hard life. But certain aspects just take a toll on us. And depending on how we're feeling, you know, little things can affect us in a pretty significant way. Um, and conversely, you know, we can be totally fine and something big happens and it will affect us, but maybe not the same way as when we're feeling, you know, weakened or not in our optimal state. So Damon, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, hopefully it, uh, it gives a little bit of uh, clarity around that. Um, thank you for the nice comments. Um, I'm just trying to see if there are any actually questions. Okay, here. Um, what to do if not getting sleep in night and keep going back to mobile, mobile again and again? So that's a great question. And it is very relevant because we are all glued to our, our devices. So um, I don't think the screen time is helping the sleep. I'm fairly certain that's been scientifically proven. Um, I really had to make a conscious decision to no longer kind of care what was going on in my social media world and in my phone world. 
um, it really gave me a lot of anxiety to be seeing like, this is happening and this is, you know, the fear of missing out. And there was a just a lot, I was just felt like I was being bombarded all the time. Um, so I hear how that's an easy thing because you're not sleeping properly and that's just a quick fix. Um, but I would maybe recommend, um, and again, I'm not a professional in this, but stuff that's helped me is really breathing, um, breathing exercises. Uh, there's a practice called Yoga Nidra you can find on YouTube or um, on Spotify, anywhere basically. Um, and it basically walks you through a body scan. So doing something that you're really just listening to as opposed to looking at and you're not getting that that light from your phone, I would really recommend that. And if it's persistent, I would recommend that you go see your doctor and um, speak to them about it. How did you handle your burnout last year during COVID when countries went into lockdown and work from home became the norm? So thank you for that question. Um, actually, my burnout was in 2019, so it was the year before. Um, when I went back, I had gone back to work um, at the tail end of 2019. So I had been back at work for about six months when COVID hit. Um, and so thankfully, I was already starting to feel better. And I felt when COVID hit that, oh, finally, the whole world is back at, at my pace. I don't have to catch up to, to everybody else. Um, everyone is kind of coming down to this chill, nobody's doing anything mode. So I, for me, that's really where um, that didn't really affect me. And I am grateful for that because I know that mental health was really a significant issue during COVID. And thankfully I was, yeah, like I said, already starting to feel better and very at peace with the idea of not engaging very much. And so it felt very healthy to me to, not have to kind of go back and go kind of feel like I had an obligation to go full blast back into my life. Um, a huge thing for me was being okay with not responding to people and turn off notifications. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, that made a huge difference for me and being able to say no, you know, to things like I, I don't have the energy to do that. Thank you for inviting me, but it's not happening for me right now. Um, Rachel, do you think that this sort of cumulative, cumulative effect of events weighing on us and resulting in a crash is what used to be thought of a midlife crisis? Um, maybe. Uh, one of the coaches that I worked with when I called her, she said, are you 37 and a half? <laughs> and I said, yes. She says, oh, that's when everybody calls me. Um, so I really thought that that was funny. I, I, I don't know if I would necessarily call it a midlife crisis. I think it's the, the way society has created the norm around work and work-life balance, um, which is only now starting to be more trendy. So I think it's um, this idea that we have to do everything, all the things and do them all well. Uh, and stay on that hamster wheel and in the rat race. So for me, that's what it felt like. Um, I think I, I hit a breaking point because I felt like I had to keep up with what everyone else was doing, which was all the things. But actually, I think we have to have a bit of a mindset shift around that, um, where we have a, a healthier balance of what we expect from ourselves, what our organizations expect from us, and how we actually incorporate uh, non-work things or things that bring us fulfillment, um, whether it be work or other, and, and, and really how we value those things. I'm just wondering if we could normalize this more, like it's, uh, like it's more common and something to be vigilant against, maintain mental health. Yeah. I. I'm so with you. That's um, one of my my reasons for doing this. And it's something that we started doing um, at CloudOps where I work is really creating this like wellness initiative to talk about mindfulness, to talk about how we're doing, um, normalizing it. And I think a lot of people are afraid, well, if I say this, then it'll affect my career and I won't get promoted or, you know, I'm going to be, uh, you know, cast aside because I had mental health issues. So um, for, for for me, it, it is really about talking about these things and, 
and normalizing it and understanding that even if it happens to us, we can actually come back stronger and healthier and happier with clearer boundaries uh, as opposed to a weakness, um, which I don't believe it is, but it requires time and effort and um, in my case, professional interventions and medical interventions. So, um, you know, I think everyone is, is is different and handles this a different way, but I think it is really important to be talking about it. Yeah, human condition, not a weakness. Exactly. It's, it's, it's part of life and we're all dealing with different things with different weights at different times. So uh, it's really about, you know, trying to, to get support, ask for support. We're, we're all in the same boat. So Jeff says, I think it's also important for us to realize that some people don't have these issues or they're able to focus those problems into different solutions. It's okay for us to handle things differently. Yeah, totally. And that was why I wanted to share my story is because when I was in this, I felt very alone and I felt like everyone else was able to do all of these things with such elegance and grace and like no big deal. Um, and so how come I wasn't or, you know, and then it turns out that actually they're, they're either not doing so well or they do half the things or they're just really good at social media <laughs> and taking great photos of themselves. Um, so, you know, I think it's it's important to be to be open and talking about these issues. So on that note, uh, I believe we're just at time. Uh, I'd really like to thank you all again for your participation. I hope that this was helpful. If you know anyone who is struggling, please share this talk with them. Um, and if anyone wants to reach out, I'd be happy to chat. So thank you all again and enjoy the rest of the conference. And I really appreciate your, your time and presence. Bye.